Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first presentation in our Databricks lecture series. I'm so glad that you could all join us. Uh, my name is Drew Pollan. I'm the academic director of the data science program here at the iSchool uh, in Berkeley. And I am very pleased to introduce Francois Calois from Databricks, who will be leading our discussion today. So Francois received a master's in engineering from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, he holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Northwestern University. Um, so after a three month data science fellowship at the data incubator in Oakland, Francois joined Microsoft as an applied scientist for the Office 365 customer support team, where he worked for two years on a data driven improvement uh, of the customer support experience. He then joined the data team at Databricks as a data scientist early this year in March 2020, um, where he has been working on customer and product analytics. So welcome, Francois. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, before we get started, sorry, I just wanted to let everybody know that we have, uh, we're going to set aside about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. So please do feel free to pose your questions either in the Q&A panel below or in the chat, and we'll return to them at the end of the session. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And Francois, uh, welcome. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Drew. Thank you uh, for the great opportunity you give me to, to present this, uh, this talk. It's uh, really nice um, and an honor to be uh, uh, speaking for, uh, for Berkeley students. Um, I'm uh, hoping, so this is a day in the life of data scientists. I'm hoping that presentation uh, will uh, make you uh, very um, enthusiastic about the life of data scientists. Uh, we're also uh, enthusiastic about Databricks um, as a company and as a, a product. Um, and before starting, um, uh, as I understand that most uh, people here uh, are uh, professionals that, um, uh, that are considering switching or upgrading their skill toward data science for their, for their career. And I kind of relate to that because I, I had kind of a similar pattern, although during my PhD. So um, that's very, that's, um, you know, I support uh, definitely that move. I'm extremely um, enthusiastic about having done it. Uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's the right move and you're going to, uh, to enjoy it greatly. So let's start. Uh, with the presentation, we can click on my slides. Perfect. So I'll start quickly first about the, my career path. Um, I'll talk about what is Databricks uh, as a product, what is the data science uh, at Databricks, so basically my, my role, uh, and also show a demo of, uh, of the product that will kind of feature um, data engineering, data analyst, and data scientist in, uh, in one demo. So I um, hope that gets you excited. So uh, first, a little bit about myself, um, my career path towards the science. Uh, so I started uh, uh, doing a master's in uh, Ecole Polytechnique, as Bruce said, um, in Paris. And uh, so if you uh, enjoy beautiful buildings, uh, Paris is a really great place. So as soon as we can go back to traveling, and I recommend you visiting. <laughs> and um, and uh, also the fun fact about that school is that uh, it's, it has a military past. So for some time I was officially a military, a French part of the French military. And I, I did um, march uh, in, uh, during the 4th of July. Uh, the, oh, <laughs> I really got Americanized. So uh, the 14th of July parade in France um, in, uh, in the Champs Elysees uh, with that. Uh, but uh, the specifics about that school is that it's really math heavy. So it gave me the passion towards solving complex problems, uh, you know, the analytical skills. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I then when I started learning data science later, I, I really connected with, uh, with that kind of um, experience learning math uh, at a high level. I think that's something extremely important. Uh, but actually, maybe at that time, it was a little bit too much math, so I really wanted to do something applied, and uh, I applied for a PhD at Northwestern in an uh, electrical engineering department. And my, the first part of my PhD was really totally hardware electrical engineering. So uh, you can see that picture. That was really me uh, in a lab. So um, uh, I was like that, uh, manipulating uh, devices, uh, chemi using chemicals, etc. Uh, and it's really only at the middle of my PhD that I, I 
realized uh, for my career and my interest, I, I was more interested in the um, kind of um, software uh, related uh, work. And um, I decided to switch towards, for my PhD, towards computational electromagnetics and started learning programming. So uh, you know, if that can be uh, optimistic, if you're wondering, uh, am I doing that too late or something? No way. I started learning programming three years in my PhD. Uh, before, the, the best that I had written was maybe 20, 30 lines of MATLAB code. So I learned MATLAB year three, uh, year four, I started learning Python. Uh, year five, uh, I, um, I did a lot of data science uh, online. Uh, you know, Coursera is really a great platform to, uh, to, le to learn. And I just learned today that Databricks is, uh, is going to open a MOOC on Coursera. So uh, uh, I'm excited uh, for you that you, you will have the opportunity to also, also uh, try that. And uh, I'll probably try it myself. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so uh, yeah, I learned data science really the last year of my PhD. And uh, at the end, I applied for the, uh, the data incubator. That's, um, that's maybe a little bit similar to what, what you're doing, uh, but much shorter. And it gave, gave me, it's, it's really important because it, it gave me a really a great kind of applied skills, uh, um, a little bit more practical skills beyond what you can learn on Coursera. Uh, and, uh, and that was extremely useful to, uh, to get a job at Microsoft. But uh, before talking about uh, Microsoft, um, uh, so I, I feel it's really nice to actually have the experience from the hardware. Um, so I, I don't see that as a disadvantage. Uh, 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 it's quite the opposite. I feel having the experience um, of another field gives you a lot more um, <clears throat> insights about how to deal with data. You know, having to deal with real life, real life devices like I, I used to in um, in, uh, in the hardware uh, work I was doing. Um, so you, you can see that the, the device is not behaving like theory. It's not at all. It's dominated by noises, by, by a lot of external factors. And, um, and really the work of the PG is trying to quantify those external factors uh, and try to find an explanation, try to solve you know, the electrical, the, the, the performance issues that you may have. And uh, as data scientists, it's a little bit like that. You know, uh, you cannot model exactly uh, how, uh, when a user is going to buy your product. It's influenced by so many external factors that you have zero control on. You just try to figure out what's, what are the useful factors that you, can, that you can use to improve your model a little bit, bit by bit. You know, um, and, uh, and that kind of research, uh, that experience with another field, uh, I feel is really bringing a lot of um, a lot of goodness to me to to my work uh, as a data scientist now uh, so at Microsoft so I started uh, my uh, for my first real job at Microsoft as an applied scientist in the office 365 uh, customer support uh, team and uh, you can think it's you know millions of support calls every, that are made every year to uh, to Microsoft uh, to Microsoft uh, support engineers and um, and the job of data, data scientists is to uh, to try to um, look through the data and uh, figure out ways to improve the support to make it more efficient to make it better for the for the customer, and um, and that, that's really you know I had zero experience uh, with that kind of field of customer support before, but that that really opened um, uh, uh, like I I really learned a lot through that process. Um, first, I feel that. It's great to start your career as a data scientist in a big company that has a uh, track record of data science of, of using data science that has uh, so, some experience. Microsoft was great because I could have um, so there were uh, I had amazing colleagues uh, that I, I, I learned a lot while working with them. Also, uh, a lot of tools. It's really important. You have Azure. You can use Azure. You can use Microsoft Power BI, etc. You can use a lot of tools that uh, um, help your uh, yeah your life as a data scientist. Uh, so I really learned a lot. And uh, the couple of things that I figured out that were important uh, beyond you know what I had learned from the classes and online classes that I had before uh, was that uh, first uh, a big part of the data scientist's work is to figure out, you know, you have an ocean of data. It's not like you have a clean Kaggle data set that someone has prepared for you. Here you have an ocean of data coming from various sources in your company, especially in Microsoft, you, 
you don't even know who who uh, who got the data uh, that, that that you see and trying to figure out you know what it means um, how to clean it how to how to process it how yeah how to interpret it uh, is a big part of the job so that's the data engineering data analysis that um, that uh, actually is more is typically ninety percent of the work of the data scientist uh, so you we learn the modeling in class because you know that you do because that's eventually what you want to do um but uh there there is then all this process that you have to do to clean the data to to aggregate it in order to have something useful for your final modeling um so that's something that i learned i learned also uh, the importance of having a good uh, bi tool uh, bi business intelligence so basically something that uh, that enables you to do some nice visualization so you probably use matplotlib uh, uh on jupyter uh, that's what I used to do to, to visualize data. When I learned about Power BI, uh, my productivity increased by a factor of uh, a lot. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's because suddenly, instead of spending you know, uh, a lot of time to, 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 to make your plot in the right way, here it takes a few seconds, you can spin up uh, to have you know, 10 plots in the same window, so you can compare uh, the data versus various features. And, uh, and suddenly you understand your data a lot, a lot more then you can also communicate it through the comp company. So that's something that I, I really learned. Um, yeah, I have the right tools and do a lot of data analysis, data processing. And uh, that's what I'll try to uh, show also in the demo, how important it is to kind of broaden uh, your, um, your, uh, the horizon of, um, of the, the data science workflow that you, that you do, the data science tools that you use uh, in your work. And um, at the end of my work at, with Microsoft, uh, so, so uh, uh, toward, towards the end, actually uh, a teammate uh, uh, joined my team and introduced us to Databricks because Microsoft has access to Databricks and uh, Databricks as a, as a product. And I found that amazing because a lot of the things that I was doing uh, on multiple tools at Microsoft, uh, suddenly, yeah, there is this nice UI where you can do all of that uh, yeah, in, in one place and it, it simplifies a lot of things. So uh, uh, I was lucky to join their bricks uh, in last March, exactly at the, as the shutdown started. And uh, so I've worked uh, data scientist, uh, as a, at Databricks as a data scientist uh, since then. Uh, and I'm kind of lucky because um, I use, my main tool is Databricks and I use it on data about Databricks. So that's, uh, that's really, uh, something they really enjoy and uh, now let me um let me try to explain you know kind of what is databricks and it, this is really a simplified view databricks is a very uh has a lot of capabilities i'll just talk about the, uh, a few main ones um uh i see a question applied scientist versus data scientist honestly uh it really depends on the company i, I will actually have a slide that shows that things are very blurry. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so um, their bricks, um, the very, very uh, simple way to see it is Jupyter in the cloud. So you're probably used to working with Jupyter, I guess, uh, in the program. So, um, so the nice thing of their bricks is you can then use it with, the, with data that's somewhere else, maybe tens of terabytes. You're not limited by your laptop capacity. You can use hundreds of machines to process it uh, because it's, it's all in the cloud. And you have the parallelization, the parallelization of Spark, Spark SQL, Spark ML, so Spark SQL for data processing, Spark ML for, um, for machine learning, uh, so that you can run your workflows on hundreds, maybe thousands of nodes. You have Delta Lake, which is a data management layer. And uh, to, to illustrate how important this is, let's imagine that you have a table that is hundreds of, of terabytes. And that's not a crazy thing. Like think about all the activity of Facebook user on the platform. That's probably maybe hundreds of petabytes of, uh, of data as a table because it's billions of user times several thousands of, uh, of actions per user um, uh, throughout the history. So there is no way you can read that as one CSV file or to put that in a, in a database. So what happens typically is those kind of things 
are divided into millions of small files. Uh, and, uh, and then you have to deal with, uh, with, with those small files to, to, you know, to aggregate it when, you, when you're doing queries. So Delta uh, enables you to do all that, to, to, uh, to, to not worry at all about, the, um, about that dividing this table into files. You just see it as a regular SQL tables that you can query with regular SQL queries. And that's it. Um, so it, it's extremely uh, powerful. And it's a lot more than that, but uh, in the essence, that's using SQL on terabytes of data. Um, second thing, you have uh, MLflow. That's uh, ML management uh, layer. The, um, the idea is that, you know, you've probably done that in, in your classes, uh, that um, you, you train your model on, on Jupyter, you do some optimization and, and that's it. But let's imagine now you have, uh, you have tens of projects where for each you train models, you want to compare, uh, uh, you know, linear regression, random forest, uh, neural networks. Um, you want to update it every day with new data that comes up. You start to have a huge amount of models. Uh, you want to keep the history of them. If you want to write the code to, to manage all of that, it's, uh, it's very complex. MLflow, it provides API to, uh, to, do, to do that uh, in, a, in a much simpler, much simpler way and, uh, and has a UI also uh, for that. So that's a technology also developed by the RICS. Redash for visualization. Uh, so I'll, I'll demo uh, this one um, to make now simple graphs uh, quite easily and share them in the company and automation. So for example, if you've developed a nice uh, model that can be uh, useful, but you want to update it every day with new data, uh, you can just uh, set up a job to run your uh, logic every day to get the new job, to, to get the new, uh, the new model. So yeah, Databricks is all that and, and a lot more, but I'll, I'll just focus on that because I think th those are the main, uh, the main components. And it really empowers you to do more. And the other thing about Databricks is that it's growing like that. So uh, it's super exciting to be in that company. Um, you, I mean, at Berkeley, you, the founders are from Berkeley, so you, you probably know about it, but uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a, an amazing company to work for, uh, very smart people and, um, um, uh, and I really enjoy uh, working there and hopefully you will maybe I uh, will have the opportunity to work with some of you in the future. Uh, what's data science at Databricks? I'll be a little bit quick on that. If you can ask me maybe later in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but um, basically we have a lot of data objects uh, with a lot of data on it. And the goal is to, um, to use the data that we have to improve the product uh, to also provide insights to, uh, to our um, sales and, um, and customer success uh, people so that they can know their customers better and deliver uh, better service to them. Uh, and, uh, and yes, and uh, so th those two main things. And the first, uh, and, and here are the objects that we deal with. So the customers, we provide insights about customers, about users about what the users do. For example, uh, they run commands, they run jobs, uh, et cetera. And then you have also a lot, and that's really nice also, you know, uh, uh, you know data science, it's about a, lo a lot of computational power um, de dealing with big data. So you have a lot of data about how people use uh, clusters, uh, clusters of, um, of, of many machines uh, that are belong to Azure, AWS, to, uh, to run the workflows the data that is, that is stored, the way that the queries are run. So the Spark queries ML, we have a lot of data on that. And also all the features that are present. So it's, it's, there, there's really a lot of data on a lot of uh, topics and, uh, and really it's amazing the, the amount of things that we can learn, um, that we can learn from, um, from that, from that data, which in turn then helps to uh, improve the product. Um, Okay, and to illustrate a little bit how that process is done, and I try to make it very general so that I think it applies to uh, most of the data science work. Uh, so it's really that you have at the center of your customer, any company sells things to customers. And uh, this customer generates some activity. Uh, for, let's take uh, the simplest thing, the, 
you know, Amazon has a, an e-commerce web, is an e-commerce website. Uh, you go on the website, you, there is some activity that is logged. So you, it creates user, it's, you can tell it's user events. Uh, and eventually what you want to transform that, you want to transform that into a, some kind of recommender system or just insights, but something that will enable you to provide a better user experience. And, it, and really, and there is then a big data workflow uh, uh, to, to get from the events to the recommender system. So the first thing is to log those events somewhere. Um, so that's typically the work of a software engineer uh, that will, um, for example, use Apache Kafka. There are a lot of other technologies to log data, typically in a data lake or a database. Then uh, you have the data engineer who will take that data clean it, aggregate it, uh, do a lot of processing, but, and then store it in uh, something, uh, in a typical data warehouse. And a concept that Derix is pushing for a lake house, something that's uh, both data lake and a data warehouse. And the main difference is data warehouse, we can do all the SQL, all SQL operations uh, on it. So it's, um, um, it's pretty um, uh, kind of, it's pretty easy to do data analysis directly on data warehouse. Data Lake, it's typically just a, no, a store, a file store. So, um, so, so you, you cannot do too much uh, on it. It's just a cheap place where you can store a lot of huge data, terabytes, petabytes. Uh, but the Lake House that concept that we're pushing is the combination of uh, those two. And, um, uh, and you have technology, so I'll illustrate those, SparkSQL and Delta Lake uh, that really enable um, and make that process easier to clean and aggregate the data. Okay, next, um, typically, then you start analyzing that data. So you have the data analyst that does ex um, EDA, um, explore, exploratory data analysis uh, to uh, generate insights from uh, those data, insights that can be then useful uh, for the business. And typically you share them with dashboards and presentations. And I'll show also how we dash uh, enables that um, uh, that work and makes it really nice. And uh, and on the other hand, you have also uh, the data scientist and uh, ML engineer who will do modeling and productionization uh, to build recommender system that in turn will help improve the product. And uh, uh, and again, we have so we have Spark, ML Lib, and ML Flow that help uh, on that process. So all that uh, all that part can be done. Uh, entirely in Databricks. And uh, next, I'll show you a demo where I'll show some examples of those, uh, of, of those uh, three uh, kind of personal. And by the way, uh, there was a question about the, uh, the title. Uh, I believe one person can do most, uh, it really depends on the, how big the company is and how you yeah, segment, but one person can do really all three uh, of the things, and I believe the tools, and uh, I hope that the rigs will become a standard, but we'll see. Uh, the tools will help to make uh, all uh, all those steps uh, easier and easier, and um, and uh, doable by uh, by just one one person, or improve the productivity of each data scientist. Uh, okay, so uh, the next uh, step for me will be to show you to kind of illustrate those three personas. Uh, work in Databricks. And for that demo, I'll uh, base it on a data set, on an e-commerce data set that I found on Kaggle. Um, basically, there are three actions in this data that are stored in the data set, three uh, user actions, view, cart, and purchase. So you can imagine it could be Amazon. It's not Amazon, but it could be Amazon. Uh, and I'll show you how the data engineer can batch import all that data into Delta, into a table, or streaming import. Uh, streaming import is real time. That means that uh, as the data comes, you append it to your uh, maybe hundred of terabytes table. Um, then I'll show you all how the data analyst can uh, generate insights from the data. So we'll, we'll see view and sales by category and by brand and uh, the profile over time and how the data scientist uh, can build a collaborative filter, filtering uh, recommender system also on Databricks. 
And if you're uh, interested, um, uh, I'll type it in the chat. Uh, uh, the, yeah, there, this is uh, all on GitHub. Uh, this is the, uh, the notebooks behind the presentation, the demo will be all on GitHub. And to give you an idea, what's the collaborative filtering recommender system doing? It's basically that. It's on Amazon. There is something that's inspired by your shopping, shopping trends that will uh, recommend you uh, things, uh, you know, based on what some data scientists learned about myself. Uh, and you can see that I'm interested in barbecue and kids uh, objects. So that's, uh, you can learn about me with that. Um, okay, so, oh. No, no, that's now that's time for uh, the the uh, the demo. So first, uh, this is uh, in Kaggle uh, the the place where I got the data. Uh, Fourteen gigabytes, uh, October and November twenty nineteen. We'll see a little bit more uh, there. So here it's the GitHub. I'll paste the, the it in the chat. Uh, you will need. I mean, you can you can have a look. You can click there, but it's uh, the the UI um, on Databricks uh, notebooks is not really nice. So I would I would recommend you rather to uh, uh, you, uh, to uh, open it uh, with Databricks. So uh, fortunately, you don't need to pay. You can try it for free here. Um, and uh, let's get started. So uh, this is a uh, notebook. As you can see, uh, it's similar to Jupyter Notebook, but there are a couple of differences. First, um, I call it, so I call it data engineer import data. I say it's Python Notebook, but I can actually use multiple languages in it. Uh, and as you can see, it's part of a project so, uh, that I call e-commerce demo that is uh, linked with the GitHub. Um, oh, oh, I sorry, uh, I see that I shared privately. Okay. Um, I saw that I cannot paste the, um, so I paste it as an answer to, uh, to one of the questions, the link, cause I could not share it. Uh, I could not share the link on the chat. looks like it was private. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so yes, I have three notebooks in that e-commerce demo project. Uh, and uh, it's very simple to create one, uh, create a notebook. Uh, and, um, and one thing, uh, so yeah, this thing is linked then to the, to the, GitHub, uh, to the GitHub repo that uh, I shared and hopefully you can see it now. Um, so that's one of the nice features of the Airbricks. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as you can see here, uh, this, this is, um, this uh, notebook is running on a cluster care called shared auto scanning apj that has 24 cores 183 gigabytes of memory and sometimes i use clusters that have terabytes of memory and uh, hundreds of cores and it really uh, enables to speed up your computation by a lot uh, if you want to get the data you just follow this uh Daybricks also has not only has the notebook but can, you can also run things in a terminal so you can run those commands in a terminal to uh to download the the data uh, into your Databricks folder. Uh, then the converting it to a CSV files were, was very simple, just unzip whatever is, uh, unzip that file. Uh, the result is two files here. So you have 2019 nov.csv and then 2019 oct october.csv, nine and 5.5 gigabytes. So we're close to big data. Uh, now, those are two CSV files. Uh, the, um, what we want is to convert them into Delta to, be some, to become basically a database. Uh, so how do we do that? First, uh, create a database, e-commerce demo, uh, and then we will create a table in that database. And that's extremely simple. That's two lines of code. This line to read the, the folder and to read the folder for all the CSV files in it, spark.read, etc. And then this line to write as uh, delta uh, over write, and I'm going to save it as e-commerce demo dot events. So the, the table is going to be called events. Uh, it took two minutes, and after two minutes, so I have a table here. 
that's called Evans, uh, 4.62 gigabytes. It's, as you can see here, number of files 12. So it's contained into 12 Parquet files. Uh, Parquet, basically, you can think it of a better CSV. First, uh, the size is smaller because it's compressed. Uh, and second, it's much faster to read. Okay. And there are 12 files, but I don't care. I don't care. All I see is a table. Is a table with uh, all, all those columns and with that schema. Uh, and, that's, um, uh, and that's what really makes their bricks uh, kind of simple to, uh, simple to use. So now uh, I only need to query uh, to make this line of query to, uh, to get the first 10 uh, rows of uh, that table. So, uh, so pretty simple. Uh, one nice thing, you can see that that is a Python notebook, but I can run Python SQL uh, commands. If I just add this person SQL, then I can run SQL commands. I can do person Scala and run Scala commands. I can run R commands uh, on it. Uh, so it, in the same location, you can run those four different languages. So yeah, uh, two lines shows you how, how you can do batch import. Now uh, I'll try to, to illustrate how you can do structured streaming import. Uh, so structured streaming, uh, it's like, yeah, in practice, the data comes every second, you know, every time a user creates an action and you may want to, uh, to get the data quickly to update your model, models quickly and be able to react uh, fast to, uh, to whatever happens. Uh, so that's str what structured streaming enables. Uh, and here I'll show you uh, an example where I will iteratively set, save each hour of the data. So I have a, a big table with two months of data. And what I'll do is, uh, so for the purpose of that demo, uh, is I'll take each hour, save it in a, in a folder as a CSV file, and then it will pick, uh, it will pick up every, uh, the CSV files every time uh, that they are appended in that folder and will append it to uh, um, a streamed table. And for that, I use also the Rix technology called the auto load loader that will just look at the, that folder to pick up new files in it. Okay, uh, by the way, sorry guys, sometimes there is a lot of code there that I will not uh, describe for the purpose of time, uh, but you can, you, can see it, uh, you can see it later from GitHub. Uh, okay, so um, the first thing I do here is uh, set the schema of the data that I want to um, the, the data that I want to save eventually, uh, and then here is the structured streaming uh, command. So I'll run it. Uh, so oh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, for for the fun and to illustrate really the the work of the data engineer, I'll remove one column from the data and uh, and add it during the structured streaming operation. Like a data engineer would enhance the raw data before saving it to, uh, to the lake house, the data warehouse. So the first thing is to define the input. So the input, as you can see, is the folder that I, um, uh, where I will save the, the raw data. So this user e-commerce demo streaming. Um, there are a couple of, of options to put, the schema to put. And here in the select process, I removed one of the columns. I, I removed the column uh, category code so that later I can uh, append it uh, to it. So I removed that column. The next step, that's to enhance the data that we are reading. And that's here where I join it with a new, uh, with a new, uh, I joined uh, the data that, that I just got with um, a, uh, a facts table that, that will tell me uh, about the mapping between the category ID that I have here and eventually the category code. So I add this category code to the information. Uh, uh, and finally, I write that in a Delta table. So I write of the stream uh, as a format Delta. I append it. That means that progressively I will append the data as, as it comes. Uh, and I will call it event stream. Okay, so um, I showed you that I started the, the process, but as you can see right now, we don't see any data. And it makes sense. I haven't set up anything to, uh, to bring data to this, um, 
to this, uh, to this folder. So now I need to create that streaming that will append every hour of data in that folder. And I do that here. And uh, this is really just a very simple loop that will take each hour of my two months of data and progressively append them. Uh, and now I'm running that command. And soon you'll see that uh, this should change. Let's wait a little bit. Can be a little bit slow to start. And you can see the, the Spark UI uh, that's running. So uh, it seems to be a little bit slow uh, right now. Okay, we're almost there. So, um, so yeah, uh, that that's that's quite simple. This there is a kind of a, a query here that will uh, um, that will get the first three thousand uh, six hundred uh, seconds of data, then the next ones, and the next one. Uh, we'll save it to Pandas. We'll uh, convert it to CSV and save it uh, save it in the in the folder that I just defined. Okay, so uh, I think the cluster doesn't have too many cores right now. Usually uh, when I use it, uh, it has uh, several hundreds of cores. Uh, so it's very fast, but maybe at this hour of the day, uh, the, it has been scaled down to a smaller uh, amount of cores. So that's a little bit slower. Uh, okay, finally, we get there. So uh, you can see the first, uh, the first batch has been saved. The auto loader picked it transform it into a delta table. And now uh, you can see, uh, so here, remember we have a 4.6 gigabyte table and I have this events stream uh, table here uh, where I have three files so far and only 52 kilobytes of data. And you can see it's October uh, 1st data. If I refresh it, it might have changed or not. No, it will change later. We'll see that uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so that's the illustration of the data engineer workflow. How you can really productionalize the way that you, that you transform your, da your data into tables. Uh, but then the goal is to use those tables. So here I'll show how you can use the, the, this table for data analysis. First, very simple, I showed it already, but uh, select, um, and by the way, here I, I made that uh, SQL notebook. It's called the Data Analyst Exploration. Uh, that's a new notebook. Uh, and uh, I select the first 10 rows. So you can see uh, what's in it. You have the event time, the type. Here is view, but you can also have view. So you can have view, cart, and purchase for e-commerce. Makes sense. Product, category ID, the category code that I deleted and then uh, um, brought it back. Uh, so you can see that's if you just, if your software engineer just provides you the category ID, how important it is for the data engineer to add the category code so that then we can do proper analysis on it. Because who is going to do an analysis on the, those uh, um, useless IDs? Um, so the brand, the price, user ID and user session. Okay, now let's get some basic statistics. So here you can see a complex query that will uh, just compute some aggregates uh, about that data. The start date is October 1st and date November 30th. So we have two months, makes sense. 68 million events, 64 million of them are views. Only 1.2 million of them are purchases. So that's interesting. So what that tells you, our kind of purchase rate, purchase to view ratio is around 2%. So that's pretty, pretty small. And that's actually extremely important business KPIs. That's something that the CEO of the company is probably going to look at. What's our purchase to view ratio? Um, the number of products, number of categories, um, number of brands, number of users, etc. So uh, it's interesting to see the, all those numbers. Uh, here, um, I computed the total sales of that company. So 445 million. So that's clear in two months, that's clear not Amazon, but uh, you can try to figure out which company that is. It, Kaggle didn't say. Uh, so 444, 45 million dollars in, uh, in just two months. Uh, now uh, we can get some statistics by category. So again, a simple SQL query with a group by category code. And you can see that the most popular category is smartphone. 
that should be a, another hint towards maybe who that uh, that retailer is. Uh, fun, uh, uh, the smartphone that is uh, almost half of all the view uh, uh, of all the events, so that's uh, very very uh, heavily biased. And um, I put the average price and the percentage of purchases, and that's interesting to see. For example, that the percentage of the purchases, so uh, the purchases to view ratio, 0.5 percent only for shoes. So it seems to be not a very um, easy to convert uh, item, but 2.6 percent for smartphone, much much better. And the activity over time, again, a simple SQL query to, uh, I like that day trunk, um, uh, the hour that will just enable you to group by uh, the data by hour very in a very simple way. Uh, and, and it shows you the, the, the hourly profile of uh, events over the, over the two, almost the two months. And you can see that peak around uh, November 15th, 15th to 17th. So that's also interesting to figure out what kind of company that is. Uh, okay, so you can see using the notebook, you can do a lot of uh, pretty nice data analysis. Now the next step is how you can um, how you can um, put that in a kind of better way and also uh, share it uh, with people in the company. So that's where you want to use a BI tool, uh, and that's where Redash uh, becomes very nice. Uh, so all the, the things here, I, I just convert it into, uh, so I, I save the queries into Redash, and then I aggregated the results into, uh, into that dashboard that shows you a couple of uh, statistics about your company. And the nice thing is that then everyone who has access to Redash uh, in, your, in the, the company will be able to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to get the insight. So that's how you can, you know, you've done some really nice analysis on your notebook rather than just presenting it uh, to, in a presentation to five, 10 people. Uh, here you can share it to the entire company so that they can use it for themselves. And here you can see again, so that's the same thing uh, that I showed earlier with the smartphone and the statistics for the smartphone. Uh, what are the top brands? Interesting to see Samsung is above Apple in terms of number of events. But when you look at the average price, the uh, Apple uh, iPhone obviously is much, much, uh, much, much high, higher average price. So the total, the total sales are, uh, are for Apple rather than for Samsung. And I like uh, biking. So, uh, uh, you know, there are 205 times 10, so 2000 brands here. But uh, so if I want to, uh, to look at, uh, for example, how, what, was, what happened with Cannondale, uh, which is a bike brand, uh, I can very easily se select that uh, using the search option. So pretty, pretty powerful tool where, yeah, uh, a program managers from your company or anyone can come and learn about the statistics about your company. This is another graph that I found very uh, insightful. Um, first, those are two different axes. So uh, the, um, the blue and white and the red um, curves have different Y axis because it's the number of views and number of purchases and they were extremely different. So I rescaled them. Uh, what's very interesting is the, the differential shape of those things. So you can see that you have the two peaks, which I believe are Europe and America. Uh, not hundred percent sure, but I, it would make sense. And uh, what you see is that the purchase uh, in red is actually uh, the, the, view, the purchase to view ratio is much higher for the European part than for the American. So it looks like European uh, view less items before buying. So they are easier to convert. So that's something interesting. Uh, think about um, uh, you can adapt your uh, company marketing strategy and spend more in ads uh, during the European time. Uh, because of that higher ratio. So that's, uh, that's something, uh, the, the, all those kind of insights can, especially for, for an e-commerce company, be critical for the business. Okay, uh, finally, so uh, my final notebook here uh, will uh, illustrate the work of the data scientists. So data scientists want to build modeling to uh, improve the product. So I'll, I'll show how we can do uh, a collaborative filtering um, algorithm uh, in Databricks. And uh, it's the most common technique used when uh, you build intelligent recommender systems. You can see some details there. I'll explain very simply. You might know even more than me uh, you know, from your classes about it, but I'll try to give a very simplistic example if you don't know. Alice bought a smartphone and a tablet. Bob bought a smartphone and headphones. So we know they are kind of similar because they 
they each bought a smartphone. So the collaborative uh, filtering algorithm will recommend the headphones to Alice and the tablet to Bob. Makes sense. Uh, for that, uh, we need a rating table. So uh, there is a famous data set, the movie lens, where you have the, the ratings from one to five for the movies. Uh, here, we don't have the movies, the, the, sorry, the ratings, because uh, we just have the actions of view, cart, and purchase. So I converted that into, uh, so uh, that's called implicit um, rating, where I could view at one, cart at five, purchase at 10. And all that is done by this uh, SQL, uh, SQL code. Uh, I will not go into the detail. You can explore that uh, in the GitHub. Uh, there, is, uh, there are some details to select top users and top categories um, also. One thing I'd like to just highlight is that how simple you can create a table also from SQL using create or replace table that e-commerce demo dot ratings using Delta. And that's it. I created a Delta table uh, with, that, uh, with, with those two lines. Um, Okay, so uh, eventually I, uh, yes. The, the next step I did is I wanted to add a negative class because view, card purchase, all that represent an interest in the, in the, in the product. I also wanted to, uh, to show the, the absence of interest and the, that by looking at just objects that uh, uh, for, for each user find some objects that the, they did not interact with and add a zero for that. That will be our negative class. So uh, that next step, uh, what's interesting with that next step is that I, don't, I did it entirely in Python because it's much harder to do it in SQL. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details of the code to do that. You can look at that for yourself. But um, I did read the interesting thing is that then for your, uh, when you're in the process of building, uh, of building your data set, that's, there are really a lot of steps to build some clean data uh, because you don't get a Kaggle data set uh, right away. Nobody gives you that in a, in a, when you're working in a company. So you have to, to build it yourself. And some of it might be easier to build in SQL. Some of it might be easier to build in Python. And it's really nice to have the, the option of, of doing uh, a part of SQL here and part of Python later um, come back to SQL. So that's, um, that, that's something that I, I really enjoy. Um, so, uh, okay. Let me just then go to the, to the result. As a result, I have category user. So basically that makes sense. I want to, for each user, predict a category, the category name, a month, 10, 11. So I divided the data set into those two months because I will use October for training and November for testing. I, I want to be able to predict. I want this, this uh, model to be able to predict uh, what products users are going to view or buy. Uh, these are things that I added for the, for the baseline. Uh, and, uh, and then I will train and test the model here. So uh, training based on months equal 10 for October, testing for months equal 11. I use a, an algorithm called the ALS, uh, alternating least squares. I will not say too much about it, but you can, uh, you can read about it in uh, here. It's, it's uh, implemented in Spark, so it's, um, implement it's, it's run in parallel. Uh, and first, I just uh, look at my baseline scores. So here, uh, what I did is just uh, try a couple of models and print their um, uh, their baseline score. Uh, it's called, um, I, well, we use the MAE, uh, mean absolute error. And basically we want to minimize that. The lowest, the better accuracy we have. Uh, this shows that, so that's the global average. Um, uh, so that's, I have no information. I can do as accurate as that. If I look at, user activity to in October to predict November, I get something worse. So that means that if you uh, did something in October, you're likely not to do it in November. And it makes sense. Uh, if I look at the category average, I do better uh, than the no information and makes sense. You know, the categories that are popular in October will also be popular, popular in November. So that makes a lot of sense. Now we want to, our model to beat that 0 0.83. Uh, I will not go into the detail, but I did typical data scientist optimization, uh, running through uh, the parameters of my ALS algorithm. And uh, I'll just show the results here. Uh, so we got a uh, be much better uh, MAE uh, of 0 0.779. Uh, that shows that we can predict better our cons uh, customer behavior. And that will, that uh, times, you know, 
uh, millions of sales, uh, that's, that's worth, this thing is worth millions of dollars. Uh, finally, what I do is recommend for all users. So for all users, I'll generate 10 recommendations of the top 10 categories. Uh, and, uh, and that's the object that then uh, is going to be saved in the database. And if I'm Amazon, uh, if, if you're an Amazon user, you go on Amazon website, Amazon website uh, figures that it's you, it will query that database in a couple of milliseconds, return the top 10 categories that you're interested in. And, uh, and I can assure you, all of you, you have somewhere in the database, your top 10 categories or top something and, uh, and provide that exactly in the, in the image that I uh, uh, showed you earlier in the presentation. Okay. You, very quickly, you, uh, you can productionize all that steps with MLflow. Uh, I just showed the links, uh, didn't have the time to prepare the, that in the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. So the, the goal was really to show that you can do all the data engineering, data analyst, data scientist process in one tool. Uh, I'm really excited to use Databricks um, uh, and, uh, and regardless, the, the, the data scientist process is a, uh, it's amazing how much you can how much you can do with the, the tools that we have uh, actually uh, currently. I hope that you're uh, as excited as me to to learn that and uh, make it part of your career. And happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Francois. Uh, yeah, we wanted to spend the last few minutes addressing any questions that you have. So, if you have a question, you can either post it in the Q and A, um, or you can raise your hand. There's a there's a raise hand feature. And I will enable your mic so you can ask your question directly. Uh, Francois, there, there are a, a couple of questions already. I'll, uh, the first one is, is a bit long. Essentially, it's, it's, if, if it's not already in the files that have been shared, can you share uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning model code? So maybe that one is one that you know we can figure out offline unless you have something to say. It, it is included or, or it's not coming or it is coming. Mm, yeah, yeah, I do not have that code, but I can uh, I can ask uh, uh, some people in, uh, in my team to provide that code. Let me just uh, save that somewhere. The next question in the Q and A pod is: How much of your day, what percentage, as a data scientist, is spent doing projects similar to that Kegel data set that you just showed? Yeah. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, to that Kaggle data set. Um, so the, I would say the data engineering, the data analysis a lot. Uh, uh, right, right now, because Databricks is still a young company and, um, and we have a, a gigantic amount of data. I spent a lot of my time uh, kind of processing the data to, to first understanding what the data means. That means all doing that, doing that uh, data analysis process of querying all the tables there. And here I showed you one table. Imagine you have 100 uh, available to you, you know, how much you, information you can get from each table, how much you can get by joining table together and getting some correlations. So, uh, so a lot of understanding what's the data that we have and how it can solve uh, business process, business questions from, uh, from the stakeholders in the company. Uh, typically program managers. Um, so yes, uh, a lot of that. And then when we, I figure out that, you know, cause we have tables that are several hundreds of terabytes. I don't want to be, I don't want to query them every time that I want to answer a question. I want to already have a job that will extract the interesting, uh, the, the, the specific information that I want to get out of it. So I'll, I'll follow that process to, uh, uh, to, and, and create a job. So I typically don't use the, the structured streaming, but I have a, a job that runs every day that will extract the, the specific data that I want and save it into a smaller, maybe 10 gigabytes table. Um, yes. Aditya asks, what are the advantages of Databricks over GCP since Google Cloud Platform has similar tools like BigQuery or AI Lab and so on? Well, obviously we're much better, but uh, no, the, the difference is Databricks is actually built on top uh, of, uh, of the AWS uh, Azure, uh, maybe in the future uh, Google, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, and, um, and, uh, and provides kind of a, 
like a better UI, like more, you, you have more capabilities in, in one tool. Like you cannot do all the things that I showed you uh, in, in Google or you can do it, but you have to use 10 tools and then you have to do the connections between the tools. Um, so that's, to me, that's the, that's the main difference. I cannot say too much because I don't use I don't use GCP. I was uh, um, I, I got uh, I got uh, uh, I got used to Databricks from uh, from my birth as a data scientist. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been Thanks. very uh, lucky and spoiled to use that product. It's very simple. Like that was the goal of that presentation. You show you three three notebooks and you have three different personas work, and uh, uh, that's really the really advantage there. Dima, hey Dima. Uh, Dima asks, can you comment on data ingestion? Uh, data ingestion? Yes. So we have a lot. Well, I uh, there are people a lot better than me uh, on that, but we have a lot of connectors to get data from various uh, from various um, sources like uh, Kafka, um, Snowflake, uh, Redshift, etc. Uh, and then. Uh, all those technologies, the stru structured streaming and batch batch imports to uh, to process what you get and transform it into delta. So that's really the process. And once the data is in delta, it's so then it's so easy to query it and to uh, and to uh, to generate those uh, to generate those graphs. You know, and like this this tool. It's really uh, it's a SQL editor, and from it I can I, I can just query hundreds of tables. And, and generate graphs that are extremely various uh, that tell me information about uh, real, a lot of things. Great. Next question. Um, how many years of experience or number of projects of this kind of work do you seek in <laughs> prospective candidates? Oof, oh, that really depends. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm not a manager. I'm data scientist, so uh, so uh, it's 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 not really m myself to speak for that. But uh, I think uh, it, it really depends. We like in our team, we have people that that was their first job. For me, that was my second job, and we just hired uh, a senior data scientist from uh, that had like ten more than ten years of experience uh, as a data scientist. So uh, there is no specific years. It really depends on kind of what what you want to do. If you want to have someone who has the experience of driving projects or someone who will come with kind of a new perspective and uh, yes. Makes sense. Uh, next question. Do you have a favorite machine learning algorithm that you use often? Yeah, and I'll probably uh, surprise uh, a lot of people. I love to use linear regression. <laughs> and the reason is that you understand exactly what you're getting. Like, you have the coefficients that tell you, okay, I, my model predicted that much because for, for, for the 80% the, the of that answer is due to that feature, 10% to that other feature, 10% to that other feature. Uh, uh, so that's why I love it. And also it's very clean. You, it's very hard to, uh, to overfit uh, with that. I'll typically, uh, Compare the results with a uh, you know a random forest um, to uh, uh, to see if I can get much better accuracy. But uh, with, with real data sets, with real business data sets, the process processes are usually mostly linear. So the random forest doesn't. Um, uh, I had this experience that very very rarely the random forest gave me a lot better accuracy. And if it gives me a, a bit better accuracy. But without the explainability, uh, although I know there are some libraries to, have, to help with explainability, but it will never be as good as just having this coefficient, this just basic coefficients in a, of your linear regression. And if I want to improve my model, then what I'll do is that I'll build nonlinear features out of uh, my linear regression. So that's kind of my modeling, uh, my modeling self that loves to uh, to do that. So like for example, I was recently trying to uh, understand. To uh, understand the, the what will be the length of a Spark query based on you know a couple of features like the size of the data, uh, the type of the data, etc. Uh, and I did did that process exactly. And actually, when I did uh, random forest, what was uh, random forest gave me a crazy good result, but that was because it was picking the queries that are run often, and because they have the exact same numbers, and it was just bucketizing the same 
uh, the same query will uh, uh, have the same input features and it will just give me a result, but that, that has no physical meaning. That, that cannot be interpreted. So, uh, so simple, simple can do a lot. Then, oh, where I would use uh, fancy algorithms, that is if you have one specific algorithm that if you improve 5%, it brings you a million dollars. That's where you want to use a fancy algorithm. But when you want to have something that with explainability that you can present easily and you know, build quickly, linear regression is really great. Thank you so much. You know, there's, there's a number of other questions in the Q&A panel. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time. So uh, I'm not sure, maybe I will, I'll try and copy them and, and maybe uh, Francois can answer them offline and I'll post them in, in Slack. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Francois, for sharing your thoughts, your experience with us, and for giving us that, that great walkthrough of a, of a demo of, of Databricks. Um, I also want to thank Databricks for hosting this lecture series and uh, everybody look out for our next in the series, which is planned for November 5th. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. And yeah, the recording of the presentation is going to be posted on this event page on the iSchool website uh, and probably up in the next week or so. So thanks everybody. And, and thanks again, Francois. Great to hear thank from you. Thank you so much, Drew. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, and have a great night.